Hello, puppies and kittens. Welcome to another episode of you hanging and talking with uh, scholars and uh, some of the experts of the world. One of the best things about my job, if we can call it that. I am once again with Bart Ehrman, and today we are well. Let's get straight to it. You are you're promoting a, a new course that you're doing on the Rapture, right? The uh, what was the subtitle of the Rapture that you had? I had it listed here. Uh, the the title is that's behind. A what history of the behind? rapture. A history Got of the rapture. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So you were obviously inspired by the remake of that movie, were you? <laughs> I haven't seen any of the movies. <laughs> the, so the movies. I, I just thought that there's yet another one coming out. So. Oh, there is. Yeah, there is. I yeah. mean, there've been three with a reprisal by Nicolas Cage. Now they've got another one. Apparently, yeah, well, people can't get enough of it. The 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 vol the novels that it's based on. Um, when the main guy behind it, Timothy LaHaye, died a few years ago, there had been 80 million copies of this thing sold. 80 million. <laughs> I don't understand what the fascination with this is. I mean, I, I know that one of the oldest documents in all of uh, in all of history, one of the oldest re you know, records we have of anybody talking about anything, was somebody complaining about the kids today and where is the world headed. But it's like the oldest parchment there is. Yeah. <laughs> They're already pitching about that. Yeah. So I, I'm going to have a little bit of a different perspective on the subject of the rapture because I mean, I deal with origins. So I'm always, I'm all the way on the other side of the book from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And also when I was raised as a, um, I was raised by a Mormon family that didn't know how to do indoctrination very well. And, and although the, all this stuff is in the book of Mormon, yeah, you know, there are references in the Book of Mormon of what's going to happen in the last days and all like that, but it doesn't seem that Mormons actually believe that part, strangely. So my my family didn't talk a lot about hell or damnation or really salvation or any of that. So it's it's a bit of a mystery to me. And I inquire to a number of different people what the rapture even means, and then you get the different the different troops of pre-trib and post-trib, and it, all of it is just empty speculation. Nobody even knows if there is such a thing. But I do have some a couple of uh, questions for you because arguing with people online, which is what I do every day. I mean, uh, we we got into the thing about where Jesus said he was going to be coming back soon. I uh, and when he and uh, this was something I, I know you I know you have a position on this, so I was a little confused about this. I've heard you say that Jesus didn't expect to be coming back, but that that confuses my reading of this. Uh, Matthew sixteen. Uh, it says, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What are they talking about? Well, so it kind of depends on whether, you, whether you're asking what, what did Jesus mean or what did yeah. Matthew mean? So uh, those I'm are taking not, Jesus in this case to be a character in Matthew. Well, that's a different thing. When I say yeah. that Jesus didn't say this, I mean Jesus didn't say it. I'm not saying that Matthew didn't say it. <laughs> Matthew says Jesus said it. <laughs> this that's is exactly this is the fundamental what I meant. <laughs> yeah, this is the fundamental issue in the study of the historical Jesus, is that you have all sorts of sayings and. Uh, deeds of Jesus recorded in the Gospels, and the historian has to decide which ones go back to Jesus himself, which ones kind of go back to Jesus but have been modified in the retelling of stories, while stories are being told by word of mouth for those decades before the Gospel writers writ them, wrote them down, which stories have been invented by storytellers in that period, which stories are the authors themselves making up. Uh, and so, the premise for all of that is um, that we have good reason for thinking that these gospels are not reliably reporting everything they report. And so you begin, is, for this kind of analysis, you begin with an analyzing the gospels to see why they can't be reporting accurately. But once you do that, then you decide, okay, did Jesus say this, that, or the other thing? And if he did say this, that, or the other thing, what did he, what did he mean by it as opposed to what does the author mean by it when he reports it? So, okay. uh, so, so your, your that's position the basic is... premise. My position is that Jesus did talk about a son of man who was coming to judge the earth, to destroy his enemies, but he was not talking about himself. Jesus, um, I, don't, I don't believe that Jesus thought he was going to die and be raised from the dead. 
Jesus was expecting a cosmic judge of the earth to come to destroy all the enemies of God and to set up a kingdom of God that would, where Jesus would be the king. Jesus expected to be made the future king, the Messiah, by the Son of Man. Uh, and the Son of Man was not Jesus. Jesus thought he was, I mean, Jesus thought that the kingdom was coming in his lifetime and he'd be the future ruler. But he didn't believe in overthrowing the Romans to set up the kingdom. He didn't, he didn't believe in political violence. He thought God, he was an apocalypticist. He thought God was going to do that. And this was the figure he was going to use, this one like a son of man mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. Jesus was convinced that Daniel 7 is describing what's going to happen and that the one like a son of man would destroy the enemies, set up the kingdom, and would make Jesus the king. That puts his final words uh, in, in much better context than other interpretations I've heard. You know, now it makes sense where he says, yeah. you know, my God, why have you forgotten me? Which obviously uh, doesn't make sense in other interpretations where, you know, as we've said before, I know so many believers who think that Jesus is God, that, you know, Jesus is the physical avatar that God uses to play in the video game we call reality. It's amazing people think that. That, that, that view was a popular view in the second Christian century, and it was a view that was declared a heresy. So this was a view that was, that was considered by the time of the Council of Nicaea. This was a complete heresy, that view. On, as to things that Jesus did or did not say or may have said or reportedly said, there's another line that says that, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And my question to you before you get any other comment on that, it was, was there ever a time, even in Jesus's own time, or even thousands of years, or, you know, thousands of years ago, or even earlier than that, that didn't already fit every one of these criteria? Yeah, it's, it's actually, it, that's one of the, um, to outsiders, a kind of amusing thing about books and online sources that talk about how the signs are now being fulfilled. Because um, so just to give you an example, there's, there, was a, there was a prophecy writer, which means a, a fundamentalist Christian who's, who's prophesying when all this stuff is going to happen. There was a prophecy writer um, named Jack Van Impey who wrote uh, book after book after book saying that the signs are being fulfilled. And if you get a couple of his books, uh, and you get a couple of his books written 30 years apart, and he's listing the signs that are now being fulfilled— it's the same list <laughs> where he thinks it's going to be like, it's going to be, you know, sometime next year. And then 30 years later, he's got the same list for now. We know it's going to be next year. <laughs> so, okay. Well, yeah, no, this is exactly a problem. One of the famous, one of the famous books about the middle ages, expectation of the end of the world is by a guy named Norman Cohn. And he said, and he has this line that says exactly that, that, you know, Every generation thinks you know that that now they're being fulfilled, but he's he's not talking about the 1980s or something. He's talking about you know the 1180s when people are saying the same exactly the same thing. I have to tell you, I I ran across that quote when I was like 12 or 13. I remember some some reference to a you know, medieval commentary that these are the end times, and I go, you got to be kidding me. And it reminds yeah. me that that on on May 21st, 2011. I was at a lakeside party of atheists celebrating the, the, the moment that the world was going to end, according to Harold Camping. We were just waiting until 6 p.m. Eastern time, and we all have our drink when the world fails to crack in half. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about well, all these, you know, these... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's a very interesting documentary. I don't know if you know this documentary about camping um, by um, Zeke Pilstrup uh, that, is, that followed him around while he was predicting all of this and followed him around after it didn't happen. And it was very interesting because um, he had made a career out of predicting the end by picking specific dates. He wrote a very large book in 1994, arguing that was the year. And then he changed the date, changed the date, changed, and finally ends up with this, this thing that you were celebrating. <laughs> and, but afterwards, he finally gave up. And he, he said he had sinned against God uh, no one can, no one's going to happen. I now realize that he's an old man at this time. And he died two years later, a disappointed man. He's one of the very few people who finally says, yeah, God, I give up. I was wrong. 
<laughs> you just don't find that. You find people like Al Lindsay, who wrote his book in 1970, The Late Great Planet Earth, and he's still saying it. <laughs> it's going to be any time now. <laughs> A few years ago, I ran into one of these apocalyptic people who was, who was protesting a convention that I happened to be in, and I just couldn't not take the bait to go outside and argue with him. Uh, and his his thing was about the, the the fourth blood moon triad and or tetrad or whatever. I, I can't remember all the nonsense, but there was quite a bit going on about September whatever in this year. And one of the things I got to say, the guy to say is, how will we know that this has happened so you can't backtrack? And he says, well, you you won't be able to buy dinner. That was his, his criteria. We, so, so the monetary systems will be collapsed. We won't, it'll yeah. be impossible for you to pay for my dinner. So yeah. if any, uh, any date after that, you yeah. won't be able to buy my dinner. So you're, you're offering to buy me dinner. On, if you're wrong, you're going to pay for my dinner. He goes, yeah, if I'm wrong, I'll pay for your dinner. I kept record of that. And when that day came and went, I made a video calling him out wherein he said the same thing that Harold Camping did. It happened. It just happened spiritually. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that goes back to the um, the Jehovah. That's how Jehovah's Witnesses started. <laughs> that kind of, it, it really did happen. You just, so I, yeah, I know. I know. Well, some people you can't, you know, I have this book. So the, the lecture I'm giving is the, about the rapture is based on this book I did on Armageddon. And I deal with this issue the in the book Armageddon. I deal with this issue of, um, what happens when people uh, turn out that they're that they're demonstrably wrong, and how do they deal with it? It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon because anthropologists developed this idea that that you've heard of called cognitive dissonance, uh, based on this phenomenon where you've got something you know is going to happen. And they, they, what they did is they studied UFO cults. They studied uh, UFO cults that said, you know, the, the Martians are coming on uh, March 14th and uh, this will be, you know, and and so they get all ready for it and they get prepared. They quit their jobs or, you know, waiting for dressed in white and then it doesn't happen. So what happens to the group? And you'd think they'd just say, oh, God, ah, oh, geez. And they, you know, they go off to do something else with their lives. But instead, they they reset the date and they become more evangelistic to try and convince more people. And these psychologists, these were anthropological psychologists, social psychologists, who showed that the reason they do that is because if you get a lot of people agreeing with you, then you don't feel so bad about being wrong. <laughs> and you start thinking again, you're right, because look how many people are agreeing with us. So, yeah, cognitive I, I got to add, and we'll, we'll close on this. I just wanted to share something with you. It sounds like this is the very group that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They are not two miles from where I live right now, there is a, there's mm -hmm. a house that, that was just before the, the, the Harold camping thing. They, they, they gave a date for when God was going to show up in his flying saucer. Ah. And the, the, the guy who lived in this house was suddenly going to become God or whatever. I, I can't remember what the, what the nonsense mm -hmm. story was. But he was from Taiwan, and he convinced a whole bunch of his home community in Taiwan to uproot themselves mm -hmm. from their thousands of generations in Taiwan. And they're just going to move to a suburb of Dallas, Texas, and they're going to all buy all these houses next to each other and wait for this flying saucer, which didn't show up on the predicted day. And it didn't wreck the religion. I don't get that. <laughs> well, but the social psychologists, that's, they developed this idea and, and they've demonstrated that it works. So, um, so uh, his book, uh, this guy is named Leon Festinger. The book is a fantastic book. It's called When Prophecy Fails. And so you, you, your prophecy doesn't come true. And then what, what happens? You, you become more evangelistic. <laughs> okay. That does sound like a fascinating book and I would like to read it, but you were not here to sell that guy's book. We're here to sell it. Well, <laughs> I talk about it in mine. So you can, you can, you can read my book on Armageddon and my course is based on that book, <laughs> my book. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bart Ehrman. Okay. Thank you.